Welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church Online. My name is Marian Brown, one of the associate pastors, and this is our on-demand version of the sermon that will be preached on this Sunday morning. And please know that our Sunday services will be live streamed beginning at 9 a.m. for the contemporary service and 11.15 for the traditional service. If you would like to have the entire worship experience on demand, that will be available on Monday morning. We appreciate you being a part of our online community, and we invite you to be active and participate through your giving. And so we thank you for your support and your generosity. Before we listen to this Sunday sermon, let's have a moment of prayer. Gracious and holy Lord, we ask that you remind us that wherever we are, we are on holy ground. And so may you help us make space. So may we receive a message that you have for us in this moment. Be in our hearts so that it's open. Be in our ears so that they are open. And be a part of our lives so that we are open to receive a challenge and an invitation. Work within us now and all around us so that we may know your presence and we may feel it fully. Through a moment now of words and scripture, speak to us, amen. Let's listen to this Sunday sermon. This morning, I'll be preaching from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 through 9, and this is what it says. From Paul, God called me to be an apostle of Christ Jesus because that is what God wanted. Also from Sosthenes, our brother in Christ, to the church of God in Corinth, to you who have been made holy in Christ Jesus, you were called to be God's holy people with all people everywhere who pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God for you because of the grace God has given you in Christ Jesus. I thank God because in Christ you have been made rich in every way. In all your speaking and all your knowledge, just as our witness about Christ has been guaranteed to you, so you have every gift from God while you wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to come again. Jesus will keep you strong until the end so that there will be no wrong in you on the day our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. God, who has called you to share everything with His Son, Christ Jesus our Lord, is faithful. Pray with me. Jesus, you are faithful, not because of our goodness, not because of our strength, but because of your grace, your Holy Spirit poured out to us. May we never take it for granted, but Lord, may your strength live in and through us, starting this day. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Read an old story about four brothers who graduated from college. They went to make their, their livelihood in the world. They became very successful. Those four, they were doctors, lawyers, successful businessmen. And once their mother got a little older, they started thinking about it and said, you know, we really need, mom has given so much to us, we need to do something for her. So for her birthday, they decided it was going to be the most special birthday ever. They got together one night, and one of the brothers, he was the oldest, is Milton. He said, you know, I decided to, to have a, a new big house built for mom. She'd been living in that little house for so long, and, and now I just had a great big new house built for her. The next brother said, you know, I, I knew you were having that house built for her, so what I did is I had a new surround sound theater built for her. I spent $100,000 on this 50-seat theater right there in the house. It has Dolby surround sound. It's a home theater that she can invite her friends to, and they can watch whatever movies, whatever they want, and right there in her house. And it's, it's a great thing. Well, all the brothers agreed. That was a, a fantastic gift. Next brother said, you know, Mom's been just mending that little car for so long, and I went to the Mercedes place and I, I, 
I bought her a, a new Mercedes SL AMG. The thing's convertible, it's gorgeous, and I had it delivered to her. They all agreed that was a great gift. Well, the youngest brother, that was Marvin, he said, you know, I ran into this preacher, and um, he told me that there was this parrot that it had taken 12 years to train this parrot to recite the whole of the Bible. It took 20 preachers, 12 years, to, to read the Bible to this parrot until the, the whole Bible this, this parrot could recite. You, all mom has to do is, is name the chapter, name the verse, and that mom's not seeing so well nowadays. And you, we know how much she loves to read the Bible. It cost me $100,000 a year for the next 20 years given to the church to get this, this Bible, this, this parrot that can read the whole Bible. But and I think she'll like it. Well, all the brothers agreed this was a great gift for their mom. Well, mom's birthday came, went. So mom wrote the thank you notes and she wrote the first one to Milton. Milton got it. said, Milton, thank you so much for the, this new big house. I really only live in one room, and now I just have so much more to clean than I've ever had. But thank you anyway. And then next to Melvin, he wrote, she wrote, thank you, Melvin, for the home theater. It has 50 seats in it, but of course all my friends are dead now, and I really can't see very well, so I never really go in there. But it does give me more that I need to clean. But thank you anyway. And then to Michael, she wrote, Michael, thank you for the new car. I'm, I'm sure it's nice to drive, but I really don't drive anymore. I have my groceries delivered here, and I really never go out, but thank you for the thought anyway. And then to the youngest son, she wrote, Dear Marvin, thank you so much. Finally, a gift that I can use. The chicken was delicious. Thank you. <laughs> well, yeah, there's a difference between being given a gift, but there's a difference between being given riches, but putting them to proper use. There's a difference, and we know that there's a difference. Paul is talking about you and me right here. He says, people everywhere who pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 5, he says, you have been made rich in every way. In verse 7, he says, you have received every gift. In verse 8, Jesus will keep you strong until the end. Did you and I have been, we've give, been given strength. We've been given the gifts. We've been given the riches. But we know there's a difference between being given something and, and receiving it, putting it to proper use. This is a thread, well, a rope really, that leads from the beginning of the, the first Corinthians all the way to the end of it, again and again and again. Paul talks about what you've received. Paul talks about what you've been given. Paul talks about the gifts again and again and again, that Paul wants you and me to know we've been more than substantially gifted equipped that we have riches, riches, riches from God. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. The riches, that we're rich in, in spirit. And that's the first thing that I want to talk about. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. This is what Paul says, is now you have received not the spirit of the world. There's that word received again, that rope that goes all the way through it. You've received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit of who is from God, that you might know the things freely given to us by God. You've received them. You've been given them. Now it's time to put them to, to proper use. Not the spirit of the world, but the spirit is from God. Tony Campolo tells a story about a preacher friend of his who's trying to get leaders in his church to rely on the spirit. Well, there's one deacon that I was a little uneasy about this whole thing. And so the pastor told him, said, well, what do you sense that the that the Spirit's leading you to do. And he said, well, the only thing I can figure is, is that, that I, I feel like God's urging me to, to, to take a, a group to the nursing home once a month for a worship service. Now, he's not calling me to preach it or to say anything or to sing or anything like that. Just take a group to, for a worship service at the nursing home once a month. So the pastor said, well, well go with it. If that's what you feel the Spirit's leading you to do, so that's what he did. Well, the deacon took 
the group there, and then he went and stood on the back wall. Well, this old fellow wheeled up in his wheelchair and held the deacon's hand during the service. And at the end of it, he didn't say anything. He just wheeled away. Next month, they went back, and the deacon went and stood in the back of the room. Well, the old fellow wheeled up again in his wheelchair, grabbed his hand, held on to it till the end of the service, and just month after month after month, the same guy would come and just hold his hand. That was, that was the only thing that we do. Until they went there one month, and, and the old guy wasn't there. The deacon went to the nurse and said, you know, there's a fellow that every month would come back and hold my hand at the back of the, the room. And the nurse said, well, he's, he's not doing very well right now. He's at the end of the hall. His daughter is here with him. Um, if you want to visit him, that's all right, but he, he won't, he's not conscious. And you might be prepared. There are tubes and things like that that are going in, in him right now. So the deacon went back to the room, knocked on the door, and nobody said anything. So he slipped in, and sure enough, the man was there, and she was right. He had tubes everywhere. So the deacon just grabbed his hand and prayed with him for a little bit. And then at the end of the prayer, he squeezed the old man's hand, and the old man squeezed back. Well, then he began to, to cloud up. His eyes got misty, and he was going to slip out of the room. And that's when a woman came into the room. She said, I'm so glad you're here. He's been waiting for you. He said he didn't want to die until Jesus came and held his hand one more time. She said, I told him that, that he would have plenty of time to, when he died to, to walk with Jesus and to hold Jesus' hand. And she said, but th that's not what dad meant. He, says, he said, I don't want to leave until I have a chance to hold the hand of Jesus once more. First Corinthians 2.12 says, Now we've received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God. That is Jesus Christ who lives through you and me. With all people everywhere who pray in the name of the Lord. That it's, it's, it's a gift. It's his riches. It's the spirit of the, the risen Christ living through, through you and me. We've received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God. By God, let his spirit live through you. You are his hands. You are his feet. You're to be transformed by him and sent out into a world that is longing to know who Jesus is. It's longing to know who Jesus is. You've been given the riches of his spirit. But... We know there's a difference between being given a gift, being given riches, and, and putting it to the proper purpose, to the proper use. The second thing I'd like to talk about this morning is, is the, you've been given the riches of, of his love. The riches, you've been made rich in love. Now, anytime... The preacher begins to talk about love, everybody kind of leans in because I think whether you're five or 105, you, well, that's something I've felt before. That's, and I heard somebody give the definition of love as love is that feeling you feel when you feel something you've never felt before. That, you know, that's the part of love that we're all familiar with, whether we're five or 105. But if we go too far down that road, I think we're headed in the wrong direction, especially when we look at what the Bible has to say about love. The, the Apostle Paul, here in this 1 Corinthians, he, he talks about love in a, in a different way. In a way where it's not just a, a feeling that you feel when you feel something you've never felt before. I remember when my mother was leading us in a family devotion. I was about five years old. My brother, my sister, and I, we were sitting in bed, and she was on the bed, and she was reading from a, a devotional guide, and she got to a part where she said, Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, I was five years old. I took that pretty literally, and I, I knew who lived next door to me. It was Kelly Frazier. She was two years older. She was a foot taller, and she was twice as strong as I was, and so I blurted out, I can't kiss Kelly Frazier, and Mom said, Tom, what are you talking about? And I said, you said Jesus said, 
love your neighbor, and that's Kelly Frazier, and if I kiss Kelly Frazier, she'll beat me up. Mom said, calm down. That's not what it means. What it means is that you do what's best for the other person, not just what's best for you. Well, Mom never took a New Testament Greek class, but she knocked it out of the park that time. This is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, starting at, at verse 4. Scripture says love is patient. Well, you know, no one always feels patient. But the definition of love is love is patient. It says love is kind. No one always feels kind. You get the idea that he's, he's not talking about a feeling here, but he goes on from there. He says it is not jealous. It does not brag. It is not arrogant. Love does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. That's where mom hit it out of the park. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It does not take into account a wrong suffered. In other words, love doesn't make lists. Well, this is what you need to do for me because I did this for you. Or, or you don't deserve my love because you haven't done what is the proper response to me. And it, it, that's a feeling that we all, all feel. This is, is not talking about a feeling here. It doesn't take into account a wrong suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Feelings fail. Not sometimes, 100% of the time. Feelings fail. The risen Christ, alive in you and me. The riches of Christ, alive in you and me. The gift of of His Spirit alive in you and me is stronger than feelings that we have. That we've received riches. Riches enough where we love not just people when they're lovable, not just when they're lovely, not just when they're likable, but even, even when they treat us bad even when we'd like to put them on our list and never let them off. That Jesus has strength that you and I don't have to love. And he starts that work, that transforming work in, in you and me today. Paul wants you to know that's the rich. That's the gift. That's the riches that you and I have been given through Jesus Christ. We're made strong in that. But I know as well as you do, there's a difference between being given a gift, being given riches, and, and putting them to proper use. You're rich. You're rich in a spirit. You're rich in love. And the last thing that I want to talk about this morning, that you're rich in the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. This is what Paul says. This is toward the very end. Next to the last chapter in his book, he says, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which you also received. There you go. There's that word received again. That's the rope that goes all the way through. Which you also received, in which also you stand, by which you also are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance. Now he's talking about the important stuff, the first importance. What I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. This is what we received, the good news. That's why Jesus came, the good news that the gospel that Jesus came to usher in a kingdom, usher in a new creation, usher in a new beginning. And we can either choose to be transformed by that news or remain unchanged. And this news, this news has to do with, with, with one great, this is the way C.S. Lewis put it, one great doctrine and one great fact, and that's what Paul puts right here. That great doctrine is redemption, that you and I can't do it on our own. That Jesus Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.21, that he became sin on our behalf, that we might be made right with God. He took 
all those things that would destroy us. He took the defeat. He took the death. He took the sin. He took the shame. He took all those things that would conquer us and he nailed them to the cross to take away their power once and for all. We've been changed, transformed, redeemed by what Jesus did on the cross. He took away all those things that would destroy us. But the great fact is that he rose from the grave, that he might live his life through us. That's the resurrection. That is the great fact, that he he lives his life through you and through me. It's the power of his spirit that will keep us strong until the end. It's not our goodness that you and I have been made rich. We've been given gifts, strength that we don't have. There's a story I read from Sonderstrom Air Force Base in Greenland. It's uh, one of the coldest Air Force bases on, on Earth. It's not the coldest, but it's one of the coldest. So the folks that are stationed there, usually they'd rather not be stationed there. Well, this story came from a time where there was an air disaster there on Sonderstrom Air Force Base. And the duty fell to the chaplain. There was only one chaplain on base there, and the duty fell to him to collect the bodies and to to meet with those that that knew those 22 who had died in the air disaster. There, there was a young lieutenant that was assigned to the chaplain. He was the mortuary officer, and the two of them were to get volunteers to help gather the bodies of the dead. They started early one morning. It was bitter cold. And they went on till late that night. That night, the people went to their rooms, the volunteer went to their rooms, all except for one. And it was that young lieutenant who was the mortuary officer. Instead of going to his room, he went to the chaplain's room. He knocked on the chaplain's door. And when the chaplain opened the door, he began to weep. And this is what he said. He said, as we were picking up the bodies today, I realized something. I realized that the only other people out there with us were the people who go to church here. I've always been an unbeliever, and I used to ridicule these same people who were out there with us. Yet they're the only persons who would or perhaps could do what we had to do today. It must have been their Christian spirit that could help them see beyond the horror to the hope. To see beyond the horror to the hope to see what can't be seen. The hope, the, the, this, this new creation, this new kingdom that's, that's been ushered right here in the middle of this old one. That it's not horror. Stronger. Stronger than defeat. Stronger than hardship. Stronger than anything that would destroy us is the risen Christ. Here today, living through you And through me, that is the good news. And we can choose to be transformed by it or to remain unchanged. This morning, it may be that um, you're in that hard place. That place that when you look around, all you see is, and all you feel, is a hurt and a pain. And it... It may be very natural. And this is a time where you hold on tight to the hand of Jesus Christ. That's a good thing. It's why Jesus came. To give strength that that you and I don't have. And to be transformed by walking with them through that hardship, through that heartache. And to look and to hope that that's more than what we feel and more than what we can see. It's relying on the strength of the risen Christ. Or maybe this morning that there's somebody that you've put on your list. The most natural thing in the world is to feel betrayed by someone who hurt you. Or maybe you're on that list. That um, you've done something that that you want to believe is not like you. And that you want to be transformed from it. You want to be changed from it. Jesus has that power through the power of his Holy Spirit to 
today, to start today, that transformation work. And so I want to pray with you right now. Pray with me. Jesus, you have the strength, the power that's stronger than anything than what, than what we feel. And that's the strength and the power that we need today. And that's the riches that you give. That's the gift that you give. The power of your Holy Spirit alive in the here and the now. That Jesus, you'll see us to the end. It may be that um, we know we need your help. And we call on your name today to hang on to your hand. That we might see hope in this hard, difficult time. Or it may be that, that we put somebody on our list and we don't have strength enough to forgive, to let them off the list. Or may, we may be the ones that we've put on our own list. We've done something that, um, or maybe we're still doing something. That we'd like to believe that it's not us. Well, it may be the us that, that you, you died on the cross to defeat. It's the sin alive in us. That it's the defeat. It's the addiction that it's, it's the death that's working in us. That you defeated on the cross. Well, you rose again to give us power we don't have. That on the cross, you took our name off that list. And you rose to live your life through us that we might be transformed. And it doesn't depend on feelings. It depends on the power of your Holy Spirit. Jesus, I ask that you breathe that power through us now. Not one day, but this day. That we might stand up and put to use the riches that you've given us. The gifts that you've given us. And put it to proper use. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us online. It is a blessing to have the gift of technology to have sermon this way. We thank you for participating. And just a reminder, if you wanna see the live services, 9 a.m. on Sunday for contemporary and 1115 Sunday morning for traditional services. And always we will have the full on-demand worship experience on Monday morning. And if there's ever a time that you would like to join us here at the physical location, we're located at 814 Mimosa Boulevard, Roswell, Georgia. We want to be connected with you. If you have a prayer request, please let us know by emailing pray at rumc.com. And we would love for you to be a part of our ministry through your giving. If you would like to support our campus and our ministries, you can do so at rumc.com slash give. And now hear these words of a benediction. Love without fear, serve with commitment. And in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go in peace. Amen.